We've been talking in the book of Philippians about something very, very important, and that is, is the sufficiency of Christ, that Christ is all I need. The book begins and closes with the ideas that Christ is all we need. Paul himself said, Christ was all I need. I, I have everything that I need in Christ. And, and so for us to be able to experience that and embrace it ourselves, we need to understand what he meant by that. And, and he, he unveils it passage by passage in the, in the book. And this morning, we're going to continue in that as we get to getting moving down towards the end of our series, but not the end yet. And today we're going to be talking about Christ is all I need because he gives me a new country, a new country. Now, what does that mean? He gives us a new country. Uh, I guess it means this. If you probably looked at the title on it already, you probably figured that if if you have a new country, it must mean you have a what? You're already there. You have an old country. So what it does is our passage is dealing not just with two countries. It's really dealing with two citizenships. Being a citizen of two countries or a citizen of one and a citizen of another. And and we'll see what that means in just a minute. Overview of this we find in Philippians chapter 3 verse 18. Citizenship number one, earth. So you can just put that down. All of us that are on the planet, we're all flying around in space right now. Uh, we're spinning like a top. We're flying through space in an orbit, and we're moving through space following our sun. And the sun is being pulled through space in a constellation. You are really moving fast right now, even though you're seated down. But Earth is one of the citizens that you were born into. The day you were conceived, you were a part of the Earth. You were given an Earth suit. Everybody here, how many of you are wearing an earth suit today? You better raise your hand. You are wearing an earth suit. It's designed to operate in this world that we live in, okay? And so we all have our earth suit on. But we're going to find here the apostle uses this in contrast as he's writing through the Holy Spirit to let us know something about our earth suit and our earth citizenship. He says here, for many walk and of whom often I have told you, and now I'm I'm weeping. The apostle says, I'm weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. So our first citizenship is that of the earth, those of us who are in this world that we live in now. Our second citizenship follows in verse 20. Philippians 3.20, For our citizenship is where? In heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state now into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power He has to subject all things to Himself. The conclusion that we see in this is that the apostle in this is making a statement. Renounce the first citizenship and embrace the second. We are to renounce the first citizenship, and we'll see why in just a few moments, and we are to embrace the second. I remember when my son was born in Mexico, and uh, we were given his birth certificate, and his, it had a really long name, uh, Charles Daniel Birch de Waddell. Uh, I don't, I've never had a day anything on the end of my name, and I had that one down there, and that was the Mexican passport, and that's who he is in Mexico. But he is a Mexican citizen because he was born where? In Mexico. Now, Linda and I are obviously not Mexicans, okay? When we were there, everybody, not only was Linda not obviously Mexican there, she was very pregnant at the time, and so wherever we went, it was like, oh, Look at that big pregnant American lady and the, and the guarito alongside of him, okay? And so we were always stared at, and, you know, but it, it, you know, it makes for easy conversation. The point was this. After Danny was born, and uh, he got an American passport. Now we have a problem. Which passport do you use? We had to use both to get out of the country. We had to use one to leave and one to get in. So we had to wait until we got both passports. Now, in the old days, it was real simple. They said at one time, when you reach a certain age, you have to renounce one of your citizenships and you embrace the other one. 
In other words, you can't serve in the Mexican army and the American army at the same time. At least you weren't able to then. And so with this was a decision that would be made once a person got to a certain age, they could choose which one they were going to be in. Now, I know that now they allow some of these things to go on, but in other countries, you cannot be a Mexican and an American at the same time citizens in both countries. You have to choose one and you have to leave the other. The Apostle Paul is presenting something here for you and me who know Christ. You have to choose. You were born into the world, but you have been given a new birth. And as a, a new birth right, you have been given a new country. And that's the, that's the theme of our thought today, and it's the theme of this teaching. You've been given a new country, and so what it implies in here is, is that we need to renounce the first and we need to embrace the second. So what does it mean? What does the Bible have to say about citizenship number one? Citizenship number one, going back to the citizenship of earth. What we need to understand is a little bit first about the political and religious background of the people in Philippi. They were not Jewish, they were Greeks. They were part of the Greek world. As such, they were very much influenced by Greek philosophy. Every time we deal with church issues and the, and the teachings in the New Testament, you're going to find these issues are going to come up. Colossians, you're going to deal with Gnosticism. And you're going to go to Ephesus, you're going to deal with Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. You go to Philippi and you're going to deal with Epicureanism. Now, Epicurean thought at that time was very popular, and it was simply this, that they, they saw as a Greek school of philosophy, and it said that satisfaction, your purpose in life, was found through physical appetites, and to follow what your desires were to achieve them was the greatest end of man. The end of man was to enjoy life. And woman, too, by the way, and men enjoy women, and by the way, that was a part of that philosophy. And so it was called Epicurean Tendencies. Now, at this time, the church that was a neophyte, even growing there, they were also a part of that world. That was a part of their culture. They, they grew up learning things about it. And Paul was very acquainted, by the way, with Greek classics. He happened to come from Tarsus. He was not raised at the time in Israel. He was raised outside. He was very well educated, and he was very familiar with the Greek classics. As a matter of fact, the verse in verse 18 and 19, these verses have their general idea coming out of Greek classical literature. And he says in here, for example, I had a picture up in the earlier one there, but uh, right now, if you, it would just kind of try to remember this, that uh, there was a, a fellow uh, there wrote a, a story, was known at that time, and you heard about the Cyclops? You know what a Cyclops is? It's like a person with one eye in the middle. Well, there's really a lot more to it than that. In, in the writing in Euripides, uh, talking about thinking of the Cyclops, who was writing in Euripides, says this, it's a quotation now from uh, Greek uh, literature, my flocks which I sacrifice to no one but myself, and not to gods, and this to my belly, the greatest of the gods, and to eat and drink each day, and to give oneself no trouble. Ah, this is the God of wise men. Now that's what Paul's quoting from there, because in, your, in the translation of the New American Standard, it says, whose God is their appetite. The literal translation is, whose God is my belly. It's a quotation of this particular passage. As a matter of fact, Robertson includes it in his particular explanation of the Greek from the writer Eupolis, who wrote this thing. He uses a very rare word in that. And it was one who said that made God his belly. And Seneca also spoke about it in that sense, meaning that sensuality in food, drink, and sex then, as now, mastered some people. These men posed as Christians, gloried in their shame. They minded earthly things. In other words, the desires and the pursuits of this world drove them. The question is, how much have they driven you in your life? From the time we're young, we're raised in it. It's the world that we've been accustomed to from the time we're children and grow up to older people. And if we stay in that world and have no change, then we have no hope. That's all there is. Eat, drink, and be merry for what? Tomorrow we what? And then what happens? It's over. It's over. 
And so the goal is get as many of the toy toys while you can because that's all there is. That's all there is. So they didn't look at eternal life. They didn't look at life after death at that point. They just said the sole purpose of man was to enjoy life. Now what is another thought, that was part of their religious background, but another part of this world they lived in was their society. Now, Philippi was Greek. Who was in charge of the world at that time? Rome, okay. Now, Paul at one time claimed he was a Roman citizen. How did Paul become a Roman citizen, though he was a Jew? He was born where? In Tarsus. Now, if, we, if you understand something about the Roman world in that day, is it ruled over the whole world. Citizenship in Rome was prime. It was something very, very important to have. It gave you rights non-citizens didn't have. Do you remember that the citizen, any citizen in Rome, could appeal to Caesar himself for his trial? He could get out of a lower court case and a lower ruler ruling case by a non-citizen of Rome who might be a king or a power in another country, and he could go directly to Caesar if he did. The Apostle Paul used that. He says, I appeal to Caesar. Do you know why he could do it? He was from Tarsus, born in Tarsus, a colony of Rome. Oh, a colony of Rome. Well, guess what? Philippi was a colony of Rome. And the people in Philippi were also citizens if they were born there. And citizenship to them was something that those who had it were very proud of being citizens of it. And so Paul is taking two very common things in their world, the citizenship they had in Rome and their religious beliefs, and these are what crept into the church as believers came in, trusting in Christ, not knowing anything else, and Paul's instructing them that he says, well, our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in heaven, it's future. Our purpose in life is not to live by the control of the flesh, which we know is going to be destroyed in the end. Our purpose in life is to serve the one with our flesh who gave us our flesh. Because we go beyond our flesh. Our flesh is going to die. It is always going to die. Someday we'll spend eternity. And that is where our real home is. That's where he's getting to in this passage. So we have to see that some things are mentioned in the Bible about the first citizenship, about the nature of the world that we live in, the nature of the world that we were born into, and the world system which drives everything that happens in this world that we live in. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, we're told to not love the world. We're told do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is what? Not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Now there we go. The desires of the appetites of the flesh. All that's in there. The lust of the eyes. Oh, I see, I want. And the boastful pride of life. The look what I have done. That's life. I graduated sumu sumu cum laude. Right? All of these things are from the world. They're not from God. They're not from God. They're not for us. That's what he says. You see, the world hates God. The world hates the true God. The world itself and system is opposed to God. In verse 17, he says, The world is passing away, and its desires are going to pass away. But the one who does the will of God does what? He abides forever. Second thing we see is, it's quite logical. The world hates God. The world hated his Christ, the Messiah, the God in the flesh. If they hated the Father, they certainly would hate the Son. Jesus said that. Isn't it interesting? John 17, 14, he says, I have given them thy word and the world has hated them. Christ gave us in this tremendous prayer an insight into the mind of God Almighty. The, the, the insight into him in John 17 is, I, I never get tired of reading John 17. It just always moves me to think of how God thinks and to be, invo and to be basically invited into that conversation. And I relive it. The world hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Think of what they did with Christ. Crucify him, they said. Flog him. 
put him down, spit in his face, reject him. That's what Christ found. And those who know Christ are going to find the same response. He says, because the world hated our Christ, they'll hate us. That's why the next one's just logical too. The world hates those who belong to Christ. It's interesting in here, in John 17, earlier in the passage, it says, even as thou gavest authority over all mankind and to all that thou hast given, he may give eternal life. You see, eternal life is what takes you out of the world and eternal life puts you in the kingdom of God. When you are not in Christ, you don't know Christ, you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, you're in the world and that's all there is. That's all you, the hope you can have. That's where we all started. That's where, I mean, I remember it vividly to this day what it was like to live in that world. But I also remember when I heard the gospel that Christ died for me, that he paid for my sins, that he offered me eternal life, total forgiveness, and he clothed me with his righteousness. He gave me a real life, and that life is eternal, and it was designed to live with him forever in his home and with his, at his home. And that's what he offers to all of us, to belong to Christ. And he said, this is eternal life. Verse 3, that they may know thee, the only true God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You see, if you know Christ, you have eternal life. If you put your faith in Christ, you know the true God. And, and John, by the way, it's very important to see why that hate is carried over into his, to his children, the, the people you that know Christ. He says, we're his children now. We're his children now. We're more than just citizens. We have a citizenship that's based on a relationship with the king. We're his children. And he says in John, 1 John 3, 1, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. And then notice this, folks. Look at that. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. The last thing we need to think about what the Bible says about the world besides these three things is this. The world is doomed. The world has an ending point. It is finite. It ends. God's kingdom is eternal. His land has no end. There is no end. There is no end of eternity. It is eternal. It has no defining points to it. You enter into eternal life. You have life that's eternal. The moment you trust Christ, you've been given eternal life. How long is that? That's for, it's eternal. That's what it means. That's why I know I'm going to heaven. The moment I trusted Christ back in 1971, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. No, I, I had no idea what would happen by the year 2014 in 1971. I'm just as saved today as I was then. And the reason because I had eternal life given to me back in 1971. When did you trust Christ? When did you start eternal life? When did you start it? See, there's no end to it. And that's what it is. We are a part of it. The world that we live in, everything in this world is doomed. It's going to come to an end. The Bible is quite clear about it and very graphic in the way it's going to end. There's going to be a number of things that are yet to take place. But look at this so that we can understand the certainty of that. In 2 Peter 3, when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. In other words, God spoke the world into existence, the universe and the earth. He spoke it into existence, didn't exist. He spoke it into existence. The earth was formed out of water and by water and through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded by water, literal flood. It was a judgment of God against mankind in this world in rebellion to him. But the present heavens and earth by his word are being reserved for what? Fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. My friends, all that we try to do, and I feel really bad for the people that are always, you know, that we need to manage our resources I have a friend of mine who's doing a great job in rebuilding the reefs down in the Keys, and they've had tremendous success doing it. He's a believer in Christ. His family is. But my friends, it's not going to work. It's, it's going to be just like building sandcastles 
eventually a wave or a tide is going to come up and take everything that we've done. It's going to be wiped away. There is no saving the earth. We can't control our future. We can't control uh, anything on this planet. To think we can is quite prideful. We can do what's wise and we manage it as resources. And we should do both. And we should honor God as the creator in those things. There's no such thing as Mother Nature, but there is Creator God. And Creator God has given us a responsibility to subdue the earth. He never took that away. And that means that we are to manage, we are to control, and we are to deal with it. But we cannot do anything to stop what is going to happen. The world is going to be destroyed by fire. That's a fact. Clearly written. And he says it's reserved. That means it's set aside to be reserved, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Now, when is that going to happen? 2 Peter 3.10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away. It's talking about the, the, not the heaven of God, but we're talking about the atmospheres and the, and the creation of God. The heavens will pass away with a roar. And the elements, the elements, the building blocks of matter will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? Now, he's referring and he's in calling us, friends, to think about this. This is not our home. We're just passing through. This is not to be our home. This is, this is temporary. And we, are, we have a home that was built in the heavens by God, a hand, by hands that were his that cannot be destroyed. And so he is begging us to take our affections off of the things of this world. And he is begging us to set our affections on the things above. Peter does it. The Apostle Paul does it. The Holy Spirit's doing it. Jesus did it. So what does the Bible have to say about citizenship number two? And that was the one being citizens of heaven. Well, we go back to 1 John and we find out we're to live as children of God. We are to live as God's children. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet appeared what we shall be. But we know when he appears, because he is going to appear again, because he resurrected, he has the power of life. He says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. That's an amazing statement there, to see him as he is. Do you look forward to that day? Oh, boy, I do. And so he says that there, and everyone who has that hope, that anticipation, that's what that means, anticipation, purifies himself, washes himself just as he is washed or pure. It should have an effect on us. People who live from that kingdom should live as members in that kingdom. If we're representing the family of God, we should live representing the family of God in all holiness and propriety. And that's what he says. We also, number two, we live in a world that does not, we live in the world, but we do not belong to the world. And, and Jesus showed us that. And back to that wonderful prayer again in John 17. He says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He says, I, he, never, he claimed no citizenship in the world at all. And he says, we are not a part of that anymore when we've trusted Christ. Sanctify them or set them apart in thy truth. Thy word is truth. For just as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. So Jesus was sent into the world to do what? To join the world? To live like the world? Or to bring out and save as many as he could? It's a rescue mission. You know, we send rescue missions in all the time. Our, our pilots get shot down in, in enemy lines. We send in a rescue mission. We send in people. They go in. They risk their lives. They risk their equipment. They do everything they can to go in and to retrieve a downed pilot or pilots or a crew because they're in enemy territory. It's a rescue mission. Jesus came into this world as a rescue mission to rescue people. And those of us that have been rescued, he wants us to be a part of his Coast Guard. See? See? That's our job. Rescue people. It's a risk. It's hard. Sometimes it, it takes a lot. And not, the people don't always want to be rescued. That's the hard part. 
But that didn't matter. Jesus came nonetheless, and he said he sends us just the same. You know, we live with a whole new set of desires. You know, a believer is given a new set of desires. It's like the child that's born desires certain things that are programmed into it. You know, I think most of us were programmed with the desire for chocolate. I, I, you know, I, it seems to be universal. Some, do you think so? That's, that's the flesh is programmed with chocolate, okay? It starts when the kids, though, they have to have milk and sugar comes in the milk, and that, that's the beginning, and then you have milk chocolate, so I guess it's just a jump in there. In there. But the point is, is that those things we were born with, we didn't really, you know, that's just there. We discover what they are, we use them, build on it. Those are the desires we have. But take a look at this in Ephesians chapter 2 about the new desires that we've been given. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. All of us who were born into the world were born dead in trespass and sin. And the way we formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. That's the whole world system. Among them, we too also formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. The word lust is appetites or desires. It's the same idea. Indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest that are in a doomed world. But God, being rich in his mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, this is the rescue he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you've been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's the idea. He came in. He did what had to be done. He rescued those who believe, who, who say, I'll, I'll go with you. you know? And he takes them out and he puts them into his, into his kingdom, into his country. He gives us a new country. There it's called the heavenlies, the heavenly places. And because of that, we live with a new hope, something that we really look forward to. It's to be something that we live constantly looking forward to that which is coming and not focusing on that which is now. In 2 Peter 3, he says this, According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Aren't you all going to be glad when you wake up in the morning in heaven? You're not going to turn on CNN. Well, you won't have, it won't be there anyhow. It's going to be in the other place. <laughs> just a joke. Just a joke. Some people are really mad now. Okay, no, just a joke. You're going to turn on the, the news and uh, all it is is going to be righteousness, things that are going good, things that are going great, things that give glory to God. No murders, no rapes, no robberies, no extortion, no Ponzi schemes, nothing there. That, you know, you're not going to wake up in the morning, the stock market crashed and your heart goes down the toilet, you know, with it. You know, and these things, these, that's not going to be there. It's not a part of it. Every day that's what you turn on in the morning. And watch, and some of you watch it all night long because that's what you're consumed or you're worried about. My friends, Christ overcame the world. We don't have to live in the anxiety and the fears which is coming up in another message. That's where he leads to with this. God doesn't want us to be worried or anxious over anything because we're citizens in his kingdom. And as such, we look at that daily. We look at that's my identity. Jesus said, I go to do what? Prepare a what? Place for you. Why? So that where I am, there you may be also. It's his ownership. It's fellowship. It's wanting to be with his people. And he's doing this for you. We live in the world, but we're not of the world. We have renounced our citizenship and we have embraced our heavenly kingdom. And so we look at this. We live in a new hope. And it's interesting in there, according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new hope in which righteousness dwells. Hebrews talks about the people of God of faith in that famous passage of, of faith in Hebrews 11. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and welcomed them from a distance, and they confessed they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Have you ever gone camping? Anybody ever go camping? 
Camping is what this kind of an illustration here. We have the idea of campers who just are going in and they're moving like travelers from place to place and staying in a tent. Abraham was a, a camper. Uh, he, he didn't even have a big RV. He just had a lot of people. And, and he was a camper. And he said, ah, oh, no, this isn't my home. I know where my home is. He had a heavenly home. And he always had his eyes on that. He always thought about that. It did something inside of him. And in verse 14, it says, Those who say such things make it clear they're seeking a country of their own. And if indeed they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, Egypt, they would have had opportunity to return. Well, if they had been focusing on that world they came out of, they could have gone back. But no, they left the one and they were going to the other. They renounced the one and they were embracing the other. They desired, verse 16, a better country, a heavenly one. They desire a better. Do you desire a better country than the one you're living in? Now, I'm not talking about the United States. I'm talking about the whole planet that we live in. I, I, sometimes I can't even think of all that's going on in the world right now that's evil. It just destroys me. I can't even, I can hardly move. I think about the murders. I think about the atrocities. I think about the genocides of which the ones we look at are only a fraction compared to what actually goes on. I think about if, if God was not restraining evil and he hadn't established governments and military and, and the powers to restrain evil, evil would be worse than it is. But it's hard to imagine it being worse than it is. It is hard to imagine it being worse. And the disease... And the suffering that people go through every day. Friends, I deal with it all the time. It just, I don't know. I just know the next one coming is everything I read about it. It's like, you know, a million percent better. There is no such thing as a million percent better. But, you know, my mind's a million percent better. They desire a better country, a heavenly one. And look at the result of this. Those that do that, that embrace their heavenly country, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. What did Jesus say he went to do? I go to a place for who? You. You have. Do you know Christ as your Savior? If you do, you have a place he went to prepare for you. And what we're doing here is we're camping. And we are doing everything we can with a mission to rescue others and have them join our campground. But this is not it. This is not, we're not trying to establish a utopia on this world. It's not going to happen here. God is going to establish his kingdom in his time. But we rescue people through the message of the gospel to be with him. Which life are you embracing? You're born into the world, but now you can renounce it. We, we are born, we have no choice in it. The, the Colossians, he says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality and impure passion, evil desires, greed, which amounts to idolatry. It's on account of these things the wrath of God is going to come. You also once walked in them when you were living in them, but now, but now you've made a choice. You see? You can leave it. You renounce it. You move away. You do it. You take on and you embrace a new life. You're reborn into the heavenly life. You can live free from the world. The moment you trusted Christ as Savior, you're reborn into the world of God. And you're taken out of the world of earth. Colossians 3.1 says, If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. You see, his kingdom is yet to come. It is not here now. It is not here now. We are, we are strangers and aliens on this earth, but we look at the king and we realize his kingdom is there. And for everyone that's with him, we're there and we'll be there with them too. But right now it's not that time, but he's coming. He is coming. So he says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Embrace your position in Christ. Embrace being a child of God. Embrace the new desires he's given you and feed those. You'll never 
wake up with a hangover if you do. You can't get too much of God. You can certainly get too much of the world. I had many hangovers in my life as a young man. I had too much of the stuff that I was around. I've never woken up, with, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I had just too much of you last night. I just enjoyed you so much. You were just so wonderful. But I can't handle it today because you had too, it was too much last night. That never happens. And by the way, you don't have to wait for the weekend to enjoy God. You can enjoy him 24-7, which means all the time, for those of you that don't know that code. <laughs> okay, just have to explain it. You know, we have some older folks here. That means older than me. That means older than me, right? I'm already there. I'm with you. <laughs> okay. My friends, the, God has a real simple way for us to, to make a practical application of this. Run to God, flee from the world. Run to God, flee from the world. It's like you're heading in one direction, you got your back on the other. 1 Timothy 6.11, the words are pretty clear. Flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness. Flee from these things and pursue the right things. Godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And in that, you're fighting the good fight. Oh, it's a battle. But you see, look what you're running towards and look what you're fleeing. We're told a number of things to flee from, and these are very important because this is where we get trapped in the world. We get like, like gigantic magnets that are dragging us back as we're trying to go in this direction. We're getting drugged back by the world, but we were given the ability to flee. Flee immorality. Immorality is rampant, always has been. People were prone to wander. Our eyes wander to places where they shouldn't be. Our mind entices ourselves into things we shouldn't think about. And with all the things that are done around us and that, are, that the, our society and our world does, it's designed to elicit immorality and immoral thoughts. So he says that. The sin that a man commits is outside the body, every one. But the immoral man sins against his own body. How true. 1 Corinthians 10, 14, we're told to flee idolatry. Idolatry is simply the worshiping the works of your own hands. It's making God out of what you make with your hands. It could be money. It could be a career. It could be all kinds of things. Come to the men's retreat. We're going to do a thing called Broken Cisterns. It's a special thing. We're going to talk about the idols in the, our lives and how they're broken cisterns. They don't hold water. But we need to recognize that. and We need to leave those and go to the one that only does hold water and cannot disappoint. We're told in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lusts. Flee the youthful lusts. Because as we get older, we should learn that these things don't satisfy, nor do they even bring about what they promise. And we should do in that place, we should pursue that righteousness. That's what we talked about. And then Ephesians chapter 4, we should flee our old manner of life. The way we lived. There is something about the way that we embraced our natural citizenship that was so, uh, so much a part of what we were, but we need to let that go. That's the hardest part for so many people is to let that old way of life go. And it's scary. You ever been afraid of new things? You ever been given a new assignment? Some of you in the military, you're, you got a new assignment coming up or you've had a new assignment. You get them all the time. Got to go here, got to go there, do this. And, and you got to meet new people. Kids have to go to new schools. They don't want to go to a new school. I like my old school. Why? Well, it's just, it's old. I, I'm used to it. We don't like new things. I can remember one time when I was trying to tell a new believer, I mean, uh, tell a friend of mine that I was a new believer, and they were asking me all these questions. I was a you know, 20-something-year-old guy, and, and uh, they said, well, do you do this? I said, no, I, I don't do that anymore. And they go, what? And I said, well, and, I, and, I, and they said, what about this? No, 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 no. And they looked at me like, man, there's nothing left. What do you do to have fun? And I thought about it, and I said, well, I have a lot of fun. And when I started telling my friend what I had fun doing, they looked at me like I was from Mars. Did you ever have that experience? 
They totally did not understand. They said, basically, well, let's just talk about the things we used to do. And I said, those are my shame. I don't want to talk about those things. Then we don't have anything to talk about. And that's pretty much the way it was. We didn't have anything else to talk about. But, oh, I can remember those days when I wanted a cigarette so bad after the Lord helped me quit. And it wasn't the cigarette itself. It was, it was a whole uh, a lifestyle of leaving and changing. You substitute one by having something else. And my friends, you flee from one, but you pursue another. And God will open the door for you to be successful because he wants you to be successful. He wants you to have his peace, which is the next sermon on it. Does it make sense? Okay. Renounce the old citizenship, embrace the new. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we've had to look at a few moments in your word. And Lord, I know I've been primarily speaking to those who have already been born again, who are children of God. They've trusted you, Lord, as their Savior, and they have that wonderful gift of eternal life. But right now, Father, maybe there's some here that haven't done that yet. It's real possible. So right now, where you are, and Father, where they're thinking about these things, I pray, Lord, that you would help them to understand your great love for them, how you went and took on flesh and provided a rescue mission just for them. But it cost you everything. It cost you the life of your son to rescue each person who's brought into your kingdom. 